to all of you for today's session on sustainable development of north eastern region through food uh, processing sector i would like to call upon mr uh, shri ibo yaima methi on the dais and i would also like to invite the net fee officials to faci uh, facilitate the sp felicitate the uh, speakers okay one by one shri amba jameer श्री अतुल मार्दिकर डॉक्टर राघवेंद्र सिंह डॉक्टर संदीप जंगू आई वुड ऑल्सो रिक्वेस्ट नेटफी ऑफिशियल टू फेलिसिटेट श्री ई वी भास्कर thank you now over to the moderator sir <laughs> it is exactly the noon time anyway i would like to wish all of you as good morning good morning to all uh at the outset uh, to make it happen this world food india the second edition i would like to thank our honorable prime minister sri narendra modi ji uh also union minister of food processing and industry sri pasupali kumar parast and also most importantly i would like to thank union minister of development of north eastern region sri ji kishan reddy ji minister of state sri bil barma ji secretary dona secretary anc all the officials from the ministry of development of north eastern region and uh, officials who are anchoring this program from the netfi guwahati all the stakeholders comprises of academicians research scholars industrialists entrepreneurs farmers and many more including the media fraternity both from the electronic and print uh in fact uh, since we have been given a limited time period for organizing this event i'll not take much time to share my uh, experiences or the my uh, speech here uh well as we all know the event is uh, 
on the sustainable development of the northeastern region through food processing sector. And for this uh, event, for this program, today we have four panelists with me. Uh, let me just read out uh, who are those uh, eminent uh, panelists uh, with me today. Uh, firstly, uh, with me I have Sri Amba Jamir, Vice President Integrated Mountain Initiative, IMI. Uh, I would request all the audience to give a big round of applause because all these panelists, they are sparing their valuable time to share for this event. And the second panelist uh, with us is Sri Atul Madrikar, CEO, Udyok Prirona. And third panelist with us is Dr. Raghavendra Singh, Principal Scientist, Agronomy, ICAR. And lastly, with us we have Dr. Sandeep Jangu, Associate Professor, Department of Food Technology, Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh. The first panelists uh, would take on the topic, building upon local food systems for food processing. And the second panelist will take on the topic, herbs and medicinal plants of Northeast, emerging opportunities in herbal and nutraceutical industries. And third panelist will take on the topic, organic farming. And lastly, the fourth panelist will take the topic on government initiative for supporting food processing industry in the NER. So I welcome all my panelists. And uh, panelists, what we have today, which we have today, they are all having the very vast experiences, especially in the Northeast and especially in their core domain areas of uh, food processing, though they will be presenting their topic from their perspectives and vis-a-vis -vis the importance, the potentialities from the Northeast, even though what we understand from the Northeast perspective is always we have been keep saying that there is a lot of uh, potentials in terms of agriculture and allied sector, including the agro food processing. But somehow, due to certain uh, inherent problems, which I would uh, share after the panelists has been given their uh, presentation. Normally, this still comes under the locking of the potentialities. So with this event, with the recommendations, we may come up with some strategies that would help in the unlocking of these potentials in the Northeast. With these few words, I once again welcome all the panelists on the dais, the eminent uh, personalities of the dais. Thank you so much. Namaskar, Jay. To begin with, uh, I would like to request Sri Amba Jamir to take on the topic, building upon local food systems for food processing. I hope this will be a deliberation with the PPT. So I would request the technical team to upload the PPT for the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Ministry of Food Processing, the Ministry for Donor and NetWe for having us here. Um, I am not a food processing uh, specialist, but I do work with uh, sustainable food systems in the Northeast. And therefore, what I'm talking about is from that perspective. Also, why I'm saying building upon local food systems is because when we are talking about food processing, it's equally important that we look at food processing not only from an economic perspective, but also from a One Health perspective. Because ultimately, the communities have to benefit first before they start earning money. The communities have to inculcate 
the modern and scientific ways of food processing before they can actually start going on to the part of an economic pathway. And therefore, the presentation is from that basis. If you look at the Northeast, um, it's a culmination of so many cultures and communities and peoples. Uh, out of more than 450 tribals in India, the Northeast alone has 225 of them. That's almost 50% of the total tribal population in India. Not population in terms of numbers, but population in terms of numbers of different tribes. Uh, and therefore, it has so many ethnic groups, so many cultures, so many different ecosystems. Um, the region also has a very, very rich traditional knowledge system. And this comes because of the fact that the, the people are so connected to the landscape that they live in, to the environment that they experience, and the different ways and means of food production systems. You have shifting cultivation, you have the wet rice cultivation, you have the terrace cultivations, and you have so many other forms of cultivations that are linked to home gardens, linked to different agroforestry systems. And food therefore plays a very, very important part in the ways and lives of the people of the region. And when I say food plays a very important part, this is where the whole genesis of food processing is going to come to light as we think about it. And food processing therefore is a very, very traditional means of how we keep our food and how we maintain our food. In those days, we did not have refrigeration. We did not have so many technologies as we had. And therefore, we would dehydrate our food, whether it's meat or vegetables or fruits. We would ferment them and we would use them in different ways and means. And of course, we all know that the Eastern Himalayas is a biodiversity hotspot. It is also a not a biodiversity hotspot only from a flora and fauna perspective, but from an agro you know, agro, agro diversity is just amazing. So that is what I wanted to say. So when you think about processing traditions and diversity, in fact, if you really think about it, uh, food processing is one of the oldest and most economical methods of development amongst communities and cultures. And when we say food processing, it's about looking into how do we maintain not just storing food for the future, but ensuring that the aromas of the food that we have, or the flavors, or the colors are all maintained and you know, stored within it, as well as the nutritional factors. So that is the ways and means of how traditionally communities have maintained food processing. It is very, very in, ingrained into the cultures, whether it is pickles, whether it is spices, smoked meat and fish, or cooking ingredients and condiments, you name it, the, the region has it all. And why I'm talking about this is, there is a lot of input from the government of India to promote food processing, no doubt, I don't deny that. But why I'm pitching, what I'm pitching here is, just as much as we are focusing on economic activities of tribal society, we should also focus on looking into the traditional ways and means of food processing, and not just on the economic ways. Because ultimately, when a tribal community is fermenting food, or processing food, or making the rice beer, or whatever you think of, it is consumed within the community also. It's not just sold outside. And therefore, it has to benefit the community first before we even think of embarking on the economic footpath. And therefore, we have to make modern food processing mechanisms an ingrained cultural activity, which then builds upon it. And then as people move ahead, as people go along, the knowledge systems that they have, the ways and means of understanding what food can be processed, which fruit can be processed, in which season they can do it. For example, people think bamboo shoot. And people talk of bamboo shoot. But not many people are aware that bamboo shoot has different tastes depending upon the different varieties of bamboo. And the different varieties of bamboo is, again, connected to the different seasonality of the bamboos. And the longevity of storage of the bamboo shoot is very dependent upon the different species of bamboo that you choose to process. And therefore, it's not just blindly going and collecting bamboo shoots and bringing it into a factory and processing it and thinning it and packaging it and selling it off. So a real food, a person who understands food will see and understand that there is much more ingrained dynamics in terms of species selection, in terms of seasonality, in terms of packaging. And that is it, you know, when it, we talk about all this. When we also talk about food and fruits in the region, the region has 
a larger variety of wild and lesser known fruits. The Northeast is the global home of uh, the citrus fruit. That's where the citrus fruit has spread to the world, as we know. But it's not just the citrus fruits. There's so many different types of berries and cherries and fruits and other uh, root vegetables and mushrooms, which many people are not aware about. And these can be easily, and they are being processed, they are being dehydrated, they are being kept, and they're being converted into wine, they're being converted into condiments, and so many other things. How, therefore, must we build upon this? Because if we do not, if we focus only on a key species which has a market value and forget about processing such things, I think we are losing, we'll be missing the woods for the trees. So as, as a policy directive, and also as investors, if any of you are here as investors, this is where the, the real gold is, because this is the unknown, and this is where the niche is. This is what is going to make your products uh, attractive and really, really marketable in the long run. Um, what therefore must be done, if you think of it? I think to begin with, even as a ministry for food processing industries, uh, focusing on food processing, good, but as a ministry, you also have an onus to ensure that the source of your raw materials is known and is secured and is understood. And there is not too much documentation of what exists. People talk about the diversity in the region. People talk about the traditions and the knowledge. But many of this uh, get talked about, get mentioned in a few reports here and there, but there is no concerted initiative to document this. And once you document it, only can you start researching on it. And only once you research on it can you start getting innovative in what you want to do. And I think we need to really think in terms of that. And I wouldn't be talking too much about nutritive and other medicinal values, but again, so much potential is there in terms of processing for medicines, processing for other nutritional food products. And I think that's another area which we must really look at, into and not just only focus on fruits and jams and pickles and other things, but so many other larger industries can actually come and play in this. So adding value to what is known, again, I think that is very, very critical. And when I say adding value to what is known is the food preservation culture, the food preservation knowledge systems that exists. Uh, how much research has gone into that? Often very little. When we give trainings to communities in the region, we bring in the knowledge from what we know from universities and industries and give it to them without even asking them how do they do it. Can we build upon this? Maybe they have a better ways and means of doing it. Unfortunately, we don't tend to do that. And we're missing out a lot in this. And therefore, we need to ensure that when you come in and when you start investing or doing activities with them, it has to build upon what exists and not just bring and introduce to them as something very new. And so we have to go beyond business as usual. We have to get more imaginative. Um, the knowledge and the demand, it's amazing. Uh, the food processed, the processed food that is available in the region, um, they're being used as food condiments, as sp spices, as medicines. They're being kept, at, they're processed for storage. Dried meat, for example, can be kept as long as you want, even without refrigeration. And, and there are so many other processed uh, dried condiments that are there. Pickles, for example, it's widely known. So the traditional know-how of the communities in terms of using a plant and different parts of the plant for different purposes. Uh, certain parts for, uh, as a vegetable, certain parts as a medicine, certain parts as a condiment. From the same plant, we can get so many of them. And we need to see the seasonality of it. During which season can we get what? And even if you're talking of uh, processing jam, for example, uh, I think it's important to see, for example, when the rest of India is out of mango season in the hills, two months later, we get the best of mangoes. And we can get fresh mango jams and pickles and whatnot. Unfortunately, we have not built up upon that. We tend to go with the market with the season and just get lost in the larger stream, you know. So I think we need to start thinking very creatively in terms of how do we do this. And so the demand is huge. There is huge demand at the local markets. There is huge demand in regional markets like Guwahati. And if you go to Delhi, if you go to Bangalore, you go to Chennai, there are so many Northeast stores already coming up that shows a demand that is there. And this demand is not just from the Northeast diaspora. It's from other people around the cities that are looking for it. 
And then, of course, there's a lot of tourists that come and get things. So the knowledge in demand is amazing. And I can see my time is getting up, so I'm, I'm just going to be very, very quick. Uh, when dealing with products and producers, there we have superstar producers like the lady here from Arunachal who has really, really done wonders in terms of her rice wine and kiwi wine and so many different types of wine and other producers from different regions. But there's so many unknown producers who are really, really doing good. We need to also understand that these are the faceless producers and knowledge holders in terms of what is being done. So at the end of the day, what has to be done? We have to build upon the inherent knowledge and skills. We, can, we should not just approach the communities there with taking technology to them because a particular scheme or program says this has to be done. We have to go and build it upon them. Resources, there's more resources than we need. How do we make use of it is the larger challenge rather than the lack of resources. Food processing, not a new thing to the communities. It's a way of life. How do we, again, engage with them and build up upon what they have? So we need to really focus on the traditional and essential processed foods that is also available. Because if you're talking food processing, today if you go to a village community, a certain SSG and a certain NGO might be processing food. But is the community benefiting from that? The answer is no, actually. Because what they're processing is just an income-generating activity which is being sold to the towns and markets. But in the larger way, there is no... Uh, real activity in terms of using that processing skill to traditional food systems. <clears throat> the biggest challenge is good quality control at the community level. Sometimes you get the best of jam and pickle from a particular woman group, and then you like it so much, you go and buy it the next time, and oops, it's not the same again. And I think that is a challenge in terms of how do we, co how do we maintain that? What are the systems to put in place? And last but not the holes, we need to really, really uh, have good systems in place. We need to have uh, facilitative uh, systems which are hand-holding and develop the value chain for our products and producers. So without much ado, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, Ambazi. Uh, the eminent panelist has uh, highlighted most of the important uh, areas of uh, food processing from the <coughs> local perspective, which normally uh, doesn't fall into the modern food technologies, uh, hereby meaning many capacity has been done or the uh, bring on board uh, to promote the food processing in the region, but uh, we have ignored uh, <coughs> the traditional practices, especially has been ignored and this has to be, again, to rethink in the food processing sector in the region. This can be capitalized for most of our uh, underutilized or the wild and uh, lesser known fruits, uh, which is uh, tremendously available in the Northeast. Uh, many more information has been given uh, through his PPT. Uh, our program would be uh, managed in this way that uh, all the panelists, they, they will give their presentation first. Then after that, we will keep certain uh, timing for the audience to uh, have an interaction, or maybe raise questions, or maybe give some comments on the panelist uh, presentation. Uh, with this, uh, uh, once again, I thank uh, uh, Ambazi. Our next uh, panelist, I would request Uh, Siri Atul Madrikar, CEO Udyog Prirona, for his topic on the herbs and medicinal plants of Northeast, emerging opportunities in herbal and nutraceutical industry. So, Atul Madrikar, please. Namaste. I'm really thankful for. Ministry of Food Processing, Ministry of Donor, and our NEDFI team to give an opportunity to express my thought in front of you about the very heart-touching topic of myself, is herbs and medicinal plants uh, from Northeast for nutraceutical industry. Um, honorable dignitaries on the dais and of the dais, 
uh, I am working in this field for last 37 years and playing various roles for this nutraceutical sector. First, uh, first of all, I have to mention you. I am from Maharashtra, Solapur area. But for 13 years, more than 13 years, I am working in Northeast. This medicinal and aromatic plants or herbs, the prospectus is very, very, very large. Currently, the nutraceutical industry is more than 650 billion uh, and showing annual growth more than 8%. As far as this Northeast is concerned, those are not from Northeast. I will simply explain them because Pan India, the awareness about Northeast is little bit less. Northeast is having 2.62 lakh square kilometer area. And the land holding, geographical land holding, is near about 7.9 to 8 percent of Indian total area. The area northeast is consists of eight states, from Sikkim to Tripura, and this is the golden mine of India. See, the fact is, till today, we are not exploring or managing the resources from Northeast in a very professional way. I attracted towards Northeast, I think 15 years back, there was some problem in Arunachal Pradesh, particularly in Anjav and Lohit district. There are the orchards of Khasi oranges, and that Khasi oranges orchards are damaging very fastly due to some chemicals sprayed in the river Lohit from Chinese people. And Art of Living founder uh, Ravi Shankar Guruji asked me to visit that area and do something to save that Khasi Oranges Orchard. So I was connected with Aruna Chalanjav and Lohit district I think 15 years back. And particularly myself is a first generation entrepreneurs. I'm working in nutraceutical diet manufacturing for last uh, 20 years. And with this, my basic practical experience when I, I visited Arunachal, we are unfortunate to save the orchids at that time. But now we developed so many things for preventing such type of orchids along with art of living. After that moment, I visited entire Arunachal from Tawang to Zero. Then I uh, moved to Nagaland, then Mizoram, Manipur. Assam is normally I visited frequently. And I understand, see, the Mother Earth or the nature has given enormous resources to this Northeast area. Even one square feet land minimum 20 to 25 biodiversified herbs are available. My subject is separating bioactives from medicinal plant or from any agriculture produce. See, the lot of has been written or uh, discussed in the AC meetings, AC meeting halls and all that. The ground zero condition at Northeast is very difficult. The farmers from mainland and the farmers from Northeast, they are suffering a lot. I am the regular buyer. I am working with so many farmer group in Nagaland, in Arunachal, in Mizoram, in uh, Assam and all that. See, they are putting 100% efforts due to various reasons. The cultivation practices or harvesting seasons are only 150 to 180 days. They can take the income. They can harvest the product. 
after harvesting the product from so much go to the valley and coming bringing the products to the main road or the village road they have to spend thousands of rupees head load they have to bring the material second thing the agriculture practices are very poor in that lot of initiatives we have to take productivity is very less third one post harvest practices are very very little and that's why the spoilage or wastage of the agro produce of the aromatic plant or the medicinal plant or the spices is much higher there is missing in coordination with so many government organization what i observed matlab i am taking very much sorry from this side but this i observed so many agencies are working on the same topic but they don't know each other they don't know what they are doing we are spending the money fourth one authentic appropriate technology for herbs and medicinal plant processing is still missing because our farmers or our tribal farmers or tribal women don't understand the importance of this raw material now i am focusing you on the market side because always i am discussing about techno commercial viable business model today it is 4th of november 20, 2030 what will be the diet in 2050 if you think about the global market i divide the entire history into two parts pre covid and post covid post covid we learn a very important term one is immunity and if you want to define the immunity it is very difficult it is combination of mindset diet environment and everything but the immunity is a buzzword keyword for marketing the raw materials or the medicinal plants for example in northeast wild tulsi is available abundant lemon grass is available as a wild crop in very abundant way each crop is having not less than 1000 crores uh, product or market potential so if we consider the next 2 to 3 decades huge market is available so no worry about the market the raw material is also available in our area we have to prepare a techno commercial viable business plan which is the very favorite topic of myself is agri value chain and this agri value chain for medicinal plants we have to take as a priority and that will the outcome of this successful designing of agri value chain for medicinal plant number 1 livelihood development because the livelihood issues in northeast are very serious and that will be resolved very easily because the profit percentage we can redeploy for livelihood development and second thing sustainable agriculture these two deliverables are outcomes we can easily achieve with medicinal plant agri value chain then what are the steps we have to take the honorable government people and the think tanks are already doing so many things if you see our northeast movcd is the ongoing scheme in a very big way mission of organic value chain development in er then sfs is working nabad is working and there are so many fpcs apos ssgs and gfmcs even jaika is also working livelihood mission uh, funded by world bank and other agencies are also working we have to aggregate them and ask them 
to develop good seedlings for herbs and medicinal plants. We have to give hand holding services for FPCs because FPCs are developed as per the scheme, but FPC promoters do not know what to do. And when the scheme was over, again the problem of certification and everything is very, very difficult. So I want, uh, uh, I'm working, uh, I have established one incubation center in Agartala, that is TIDC area with our own fund. Technology I want to promote to add the value to these medicinal plants and herbs. FPCs we are working very rigorously. Planting material, we have want to sign some MOUs with medicinal plant boards and the local authorities. Second thing, we have to adopt the cluster type model. The successful cluster, commercially viable cluster, if you want to see, please visit Mahua in Gujarat, that is Bhavnagar district. In the same place, they are, there are 210 plus dehydration unit working commercially viable for onion and garlic processing. Such type of clusters we have to develop in a state at district level or some major states. Then the common that is uh, we have to establish mobile collection centers for collecting the herbs, then primary processing units, common facility units, and export facility centers in the major, uh, major area, just like Guwahati or Itanagar or Agartala and all that. See, with this, the major component of this medicinal plants or herbs is bioactives, is bioactives. And these bioactives will change the economical scenario of Northeast farmers. For example, I am working currently with NEDFI for pineapple and jackfruit economy for Tripura. While preparing the research paper and the action plan, see, pineapple is the state fruit of Tripura. And the saddest thing, while selling or while consuming the pineapple, we are throwing the crown. When we studied that crown ingredients, bromolin is the important bioactives available in crown, pineapple crown. If we separate that bromelin, that will give you minimum 50,000 crore rupees market because that is the main ingredient for cancer disease. Similarly, if you take any gooseberry, passion flower, or your Malabar nut, sweet flag, each and every medicinal plant is having at least 8 to 10 bioactives available. The scientist community from ICAR or any other research institute, they should participate in such type of agri-value chain and develop such bioactives so that medicine-free life concept we can come into existence, which is the 2050 target of even African Union. So, market... To, uh, sorry to disturb you, uh, please. Uh, yeah, one minute only. So, uh, I'm sorry I'm crossing the time limit, but this is a very favorite topic. Uh, according to me, because I'm an entrepreneur, what is missing? Strong agripreneurship is missing. If we bring this agripreneurship within our farmers, within our stakeholders, Sujalam, Sufalam, Yesari Bhumi hai, or medicinal plant, with the, uh, with the help of this medicinal and herb, uh, herbs, Northeast will be the major solution provider for global human health. Thank you. No, Uh, thank you so much, Sir Atulji. Uh, our panelist, Sir Atulji, has highlighted the prospect of uh, medicinal aromatic herbs extractions, especially the uh, biochemical extracts from the herbal 
especially medicinal aromatic plants of the Northeast, which has the prospect of 65 USD billion. Yeah. Uh, in fact, 65. 650 million. 650, sorry, I have to miss out the zero here. So it's a huge um, potential for the Northeast. And also our uh, panelist has mentioned something about the Kasi mandarins, which is uh, very, very uh, prominently and popularly and profusely growing in many of the states in the Northeast. Though, Atulji, for your kind information, even this plant has have a problem of citrus decline. So in most of the states, like uh, this is facing a problem, though the government from the Ministry of Agriculture and including the NEC, we are NEC under the Ministry of Donor, we are trying to uh, uh, intervene in terms of uh, rejuvenation of citrus program. And you also mentioned something about the difficulties of the farmers in the Northeast. Yes, many of the farmers, because of our topographical uh, and geographical issues, the transportation could be another problem, and the lack of uh, getting of uh, planting materials is also another problem. And then the, yes, most importantly, the technologist though it is available uh, in the country, even the, the country, India, no doubt we have uh, lots of technologies with us now, but the reach out to the North is still a kind of a issue and a big question. Uh, yes, market is another area, value chain, sustainable agriculture, yes. We have been talking about the sustainable agriculture in the North East. yes. North East, we have an inherent problem of the land use, the land use pattern, the land tenure seed, marketing, as well as the credit. So these are the area where sustainable agriculture normally faces big challenges. Lastly, you also mentioned about the APO APCs. Yes, this is a recent uh, initiative for the government of India. Still, it is in the infant states where most of the APCs and APOs in the Northeast will take some more time for their maturity because the formation of APO, APCs is not, uh, uh, not a very well versed uh, uh, activities for the farmers or the group of people, the farmers' interest groups in the Northeast. Uh, lastly, I just would like to mention something about the Lakadong turmeric in the Northeast, where one of the most important uh, biochemical, which we all know, the cur curcumin content. Uh, it, this particular variety, Lakadong, is having the most uh, or the highest curcumin content in the Northeast. Very recently, NEC under the Ministry of Donor, we have supported as a part of the Lakadang mission in the state of Meghalaya. Somehow, when we have visited these uh, uh, project sites, we found that the state government of Meghalaya, though it is a mission program, but in, the, in terms of value chain, they have missed out, uh, especially the extraction part of the curcumin. So very recently, again, like we have requested the state government to come up with the proposal, but it is not a very costly uh, setup. Uh, they have, the, the experts from the state government, they have mentioned that like, it'll take 1.5. Before that, curcumin ext extractions has been sent to Kerala for the extraction of curcumin. What I'm trying to say is, this is the, one of the most important ingredient where the farmers are not getting the benefit of this curcumin. However, the farmers are getting only the uh, benefit for the, uh, for, the, for the powder form, which cost rupees 300 to 350, besides having a very high content of curcumin at the farmer's level or maybe in the uh, market in the Ceylon, elsewhere in the <coughs> Northeast. So uh, I'm very thankful to the uh, Atulji for giving all this uh, insightful uh, 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 information about the herbs and medicinal plants of the Northeast. Thank you so much once again. Uh, with this, I would like to request, without taking uh, much of our time, uh, Dr. Sandeep. No, sorry, sorry. Jibo, just, Jibo, just, just one second. Okay. Uh, right. uh, Joint Secretary Donor, Madam Anuradha Shakti has joined us. We welcome her to the meeting. Good afternoon, madam. We welcome you uh, in this uh, program. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, 
next, I would like to request Dr. Raghavendra Singh, Principal Scientist, Agronomy, ICR, Merut, to take on the topic organic farming in the NER. So, thank you very much at the outset. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, respected dais, dignitaries of the dais and of the dais. Uh, my topic is particularly on organic farming status and st strategies in northeastern region of the India. So, since I worked in Sikkim, so I am very much used to discuss about whatever that I have dealt in our eight year journey in Sikkim from 2012 to 2020. So, Sikkim people are taking that this uh, Sikkim organic, uh, Sikkim organic or Sikkim organic mission is a total failure, but it is not like that. That Sikkim organic or the state which, which is the first state of our country uh, that is purely organic. If you look, look at that the northeastern region, then you find that the rainfall pattern particularly in the region, it is around uh, 2500 mm annual. And the terrain is terrace type of the farming across that the all the eight northeastern states. So if you apply anything, Prior to that 2003, when that the Sikkim declared that the uh, whole state will be organic uh, and they have started their uh, making procedure for particularly for organic farming. So they have initiated and during that period, if you see that the statistics of application of chemical fertilizer and pesticides, so there is less than 12 kg per hectare uh, in that uh, state. Right now, it is less than 20 kg per hectare, particularly in the whole northern eastern uh, state region. So that's why when as a scientist, we are advocating that the which area is uh, particularly prone for the organic farming. So we have to decide that the what are the niche area and how we have to define this niche area. So the first thing and foremost thing is the application rate of application of chemicals. So that is the blessed with um, all that the northern state region except Assam and Manipur rest of that is state is uh, witnessing or applying very meager amount of the chemicals in terms of fertilizer as well as in pesticides. So that after the successful invention of the organic farming which was declared by the honorable prime minister of India in two, uh, 2016. Uh, Sikkim uh, was the first uh, organic state of the country. So uh, taking that interest of the organic farming, another state like Arunachal Pradesh and Meghalaya, they have initiated the work on organic farming and started that the uh, adopting the organic farming in pocket or in cluster mode. So uh, another states like Assam, Meghalaya, uh, the Manipur and uh, Mizoram, they are also approaching for the organic farming, um, particularly for different crops and commodities. So if you look at the soil properties of whole northern eastern state, uh, more than 85 percent area is under acidic condition, the soil is acidic type and they are deficient in the nitrogen, phosphorus and other micronutrients. So, the, uh, the, however, if you see that the uh, status of soil organic carbon, it is uh, around one or more than one. That is uh, very much essential, particularly for that. If you suggest anything, for particularly for organic farming, organic carbon content should be more than one. That's why uh, the, whatever that input in uh, meager amount that if you have applied, uh, that would be uh, particularly reflecting in the crop. So. Uh, for that Sikkim, they have worked upon uh, from 2003, then they have set up that the Sikkim organic mission in 2010 to, to uh, 2010 and uh, from there onward they have uh, approached for phase wise manner for, for that um, uh, 
uh, certification process. They have initially taken only 15,000 uh, 15, hectare area. The total area of the Sikkim is 76,000 uh, hectare. So initially they have taken uh, 15,000 and um, uh, through ICS internal uh, that um, control system. So um, they have started and they got that the right now full state is uh, that organic state. So what are that the component why it was successful? Uh, we uh, when we worked over there we found that the around six, uh, 65,000 farm family over there but in whole Sikkim. So, uh, they all having that one or two animal components. In morning session I was sitting here um, uh, that uh, uh, the, the someone is uh, saying that the integrated farming system is more uh, important particularly for animal sector, animal uh, science sector. So in Sikkim uh, if you found, if you go then you found at least two to three component of the animal is there. So uh, people are talking about how to that uh, compensate that nutrient requirement of the crop. So they put that the uh, their uh, uh, composting unit uh, there uh, nearby that the livestock component. So they have to uh, uh, bring some microbial consortia that was supplied by the government. So they prepared that the enriched microbial composting. So that's why they have not uh, um, uh, really found hers particularly for providing that nutrient status. So. Uh, next thing is uh, uh, why that the how they are uh, coping with that the insect pest and um, diseases uh, problem particularly for the crops. So uh, several conco concoctions they have prepared locally so many that plenty of biomass is available in the Sikkim and they uh, uh, earlier speaker they are uh, pointing out that the so many herbs are there so to exploit their potential. So they are well known particularly for their management of uh, uh, that insect pest and diseases. However, some, some kind of diseases they have not managed. That is why the initial stage if you see that the particularly for large cardamom, ginger and uh, the turmeric is not affected much. But the large cardamom and ginger, so ginger uh, particularly soft rot and uh, in, in case of uh, large cardamom it is also some uh, collateral type of um, uh, diseases that has vanished initially vanished that the system but they again uh, come up with the some certain organization Indian Council of Agriculture Research which is uh, headquarter is located at Umiyam. So their seven center is in each states they are particularly working upon that development of that the um, uh, organic varieties particularly for um, those uh, which are um, selected from that local ones. So one of the more, uh, more important that the region particularly for successful implementation of this part is still that if you see that in Sikkim local varieties are very much preferable that is um, hardy or that, that um, uh, insect pest and diseases are, are not much affecting these, these local varieties compared to the high, high yielding varieties. And the productivity level of these um, high yielding varieties uh, when compared with that the local one is comparable in case of Sikkim also at our uh, that um, um, when we are working upon there. So these are the some issues particularly they have addressed by that government agencies as well as that the uh, ICR organization. Uh, to get that the um, successful for the uh, implementation of organic farming. The, prob the main problem is that the, they are subsistence type of farming. They have not surplus, enough surplus material for that the, uh, uh, to, for market purpose. So uh, cluster mode that um, sir has suggested the cluster mode is very much important. And the MOCD uh, NER is working upon particularly for four crops in Sikkim that uh, buckwheat is mo more important crop and um, uh, uh, like that large cardamom is also considered that the end cluster mode. So they are working and um, second thing is that the transportation facility is also not proper there. So uh, connectivity for the transportation, marketing and value chain 
these things are more essential particularly for the hilly terrain so that the farmer can uh, get their uh, produce uh, to a um, uh, to a uh, their uh, um, uh, where that they have to sell out that is the ma major uh, issue particularly for that the in sikkim region when we are posted at there so we found that the so these are the some concern which we have uh, found particularly for our working uh, in sikkim so this is all about that the journey of uh, organic farming in sikkim thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raghavendra. Uh, Dr. Raghavendra has uh, highlighted uh, the entire gamut of organic farming in the Northeast, being having a very vast experiences, getting from the state of Sikkim, uh, the state uh, only and only state in the country uh, which has been declared as the organic state. Uh, Dr. Raghavendra, yes, you have mentioned many more about uh, the organic farming, yes is one of the most important uh, farming system uh, currently required uh, by the, the country. However, currently, as we all understand from the perspective of agriculture and allied sector, still the scientists, the policy makers, still have the two school of thoughts. One is still largest section of the agricultural scientists and the policy makers are unable to come out from the inorganic farming, that is the conventional farming. However, having said that, yes, the another second uh, school of thought that the organic farming is also uh, taking largely on many fronts in many of the states in the country, especially in the Northeast, where the Northeast has been qualified as organic by default in most of the states because of the states being used less fertilizers as compared to the other states in the country on an average nationally. Uh, Doctor, yes, uh, organic farming has a lot of uh, advantages in terms of uh, uh, enhancement of soil quality, reduces the pollution of soil water from the chemicals runoff, and this also will uh, have a lot of uh, positive effect on the environment. However, the input materials for the organic farming that should be available to the farmers, still it is inadequate. So in many of the instances in the notice from the local context where the NEC and the Ministry of Donor, we have implemented two uh, very ambitious program. One is the Northeast Livelihood uh, Program under the World Bank Funding Project. Uh, implemented in the four states, and another one is NARCOM, jointly implemented by the government of India under NEC and Ministry of Donor with the International Fund for Agricultural Development headquartered in Rome. When we looked into the organic farming, many of the area happens to be a big challenges because of the availability of the input materials for being taken up as a organic farming. Yes, organic farming is happening uh, in pockets, in corners, not in a mast except the state of Sikkim. But on the other day, when I interacted with the officials from the state of Sikkim, even they have still expressed the inadequate availability of uh, input items, say for example, biofertilizers and biopesticides. So these are the challenges. Still then, uh, yes, we all need to focus more on the organic farming. Yes, why not uh, we the uh, people in the country need to have the organically produced crops However, when we talked about the organic farming, many a times the producers or the uh, uh, organic uh, policy makers, we think of the export of organic uh, products uh, to the other countries for, the, for fetching the remunerative prices. But my question here is, yes, we should go for the organic farming. Why don't we give the first preference to the nation first? This is what uh, I would like to uh, focus on more, uh, yes. Again, you also mentioned something about the most important uh, millets, and then also uh, this uh, 2023 has been declared as International Year of Millets. So uh, the reason has been uh, uh, 
mapped or the, has been identified as one of the most important uh, area for the production of millets. The, uh, the region has advantages production, production of uh, buckwheat and then the finger millets, fox millets, and many other millets, which is some of them are very, very underutilized and then less than known. Uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raghavendra. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to take on, uh, meaning I would like to request our uh, last speaker, Dr. Sandeep Jangu, Associate Professor, Department of Food Technology, Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh, to take on the topic, Government Initiative for Supporting Food Processing Industry in NER. Thank you, sir. So, very good afternoon to one and all present here. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Ministry of Food Processing Industries donor and NEDFI for giving this uh, such a wonderful opportunity to present in front of you. Today, the topic of my discussion is government initiatives uh, for supporting food processing industries uh, with special considerations of Northeast. Although this one is a, a very broad topic, I'll try to stick only with the funding opportunities in food processing sector, especially for the Northeastern region. So before coming to the core topic, let's have a broad overview on agricultural sector of India. So if you'll see from last 20, 25 years, the growth in agriculture sector is highly volatile. And in past five, six years, the growth rate is, uh, the average growth rate is 4.6%. If I'll talk about the contribution of this agriculture sector in our GDP, uh, in 1950, after independence, the major contribution of agriculture sector was uh, more than 50% in GDP. And now it has fallen down to 18% in past 70 years. Whereas if you'll see other service sectors, they keep on increasing and they have crossed more than 50% contribution in the GDP. The major commodities from agriculture sector which we are exporting from our countries, country include the mainly rice, apart from that meat and meat products, and the processing sector, very less and it's, it's not even significant if we'll see the export market. And if I'll talk about the production, Grain production in our country has crossed a mark of 315 million tons in 21-22 and we are the third largest producer of grain in the world after China and US. The major share in this 315 million ton is of rice. We have crossed a mark of 130 million ton production of rice in our country and more than 112 million tons wheat we are producing apart from other minor grains. If I'll see the projections after 10 years, where we'll be in food processing or like in the agriculture sector. So we have crossed a mark of 315 million tons of grain now. And after 10 years, we can see we'll cross 400 million tons of grain. We are the second largest producers of fruits and vegetables in the world after China. And we are the largest contributors in milk production throughout the world. We contribute more than 20% of the total milk production of the world. So in, in future, this production of fruits and vegetables, milk and grains, they keep on growing. And when we'll see the contribution of these commodities in our processing sector, the major share is of spices and grains. Apart from that, 15% contribution comes from the convenience food. Convenience food here means the uh, products which we are like ready to use, open and eat kind of chocolates and chips and these kind of commodities. Non-alcoholic beverage, 9%. Even after having largest producer of milk, milk, fruits and vegetables all together contribute only 8% in the processing sector. Apart from that, other minor contributions are also there in front of you. If I'll talk about the pro uh, food processing sector, the major share comes from the unorganized sector. It's more than 40% and only 25% of our food processing sector comes under the organized category. My purpose of telling these few, uh, you can say, things related to agriculture and food processing is 
why government has taken initiatives to promote food processing. We have plenty of raw material. By seeing the future prospects that our production is growing, to minimize the wastage levels, to provide employment, and the most important one is to support farmers by hand-holding or by supporting them economically for their produce. By seeing all these things, various ministries and center government organizations, they have taken initiatives and they provided financial supports. They started providing financial supports from past 10 years, those who are working in the food processing sector. Starting with the ministry as this event is organized by MOFP, so I'll first take up the Ministry of Food Processing Industry schemes. After that, we'll come with other ministry uh, initiatives also. So quickly, uh, Ministry of Food Processing Industry started this Pradhan Mantri uh, Kisan Sampada Yojana, which is a, like a kind of umbrella scheme under which various sub-schemes, they are there. Right now you can see some six, seven schemes they have initiated for some of the schemes, they have completed their targets. So right now I think four to five schemes, they are open. So the major schemes like your mega food park, backward and forward linkages, and then your HRD scheme, they have completed their targets. And other schemes like unit establishment, agro processing cluster, you can say mini food park scheme, cold chain, they are still on. And right now, if I tell today, it's 4th of November, 22nd November is the uh, like last date for submission of EOIs for these uh, schemes. So let's take them one by one. Quickly, I'll go through all these schemes. Since this cold chain is a like uh, Ministry of Food Processing Industry scheme, so they are not only providing support for putting up uh, cold stores, some value addition should have to be required. So as per this scheme, they are providing a subsidy of 10 CR or maximum up to 50% for the northeastern region. As I've told, like, they have some special considerations for the northeast. For general or plain areas, the support is maximum up to 35 35%. And for northeastern region, they have extra 15% weightage. And in this scheme, along with the cold chain, even if you are putting minimal processing units like cleaning, sorting, grading, that can also be covered. So minimum processing at farm gate level is must. Apart from that, distribution hub or refer transport, whatever you are choosing, that's up to you. Talking about the eligibility, most of the uh, your central state PSUs, NGOs, FPCs, self-help groups, uh, proprietor firms, and various uh, other agencies, they are eligible, as you can see in this, sli uh, in this slide. The minimum requirement is like 20% term loan should have to be there. And the net worth of the promoter should have to be 1.5 times than the grant which he, is, he or she is seeking for. The next one is your unit establishment scheme. The name is creation and expansion of food processing and preservation capacities. This scheme is not only for uh, the new startups or those who want to come up with the unit, those who are already having their units, if they want to expand their production capacity uh, by minimum 25%, they can also apply under this scheme. And the grant is like 50% for the northeastern region with an upper cap of 5 CR. Eligibility in most of the uh, MOFP schemes is more or less same. For northeastern region, the promoter should have to, uh, minimum uh, minimal contribution should have to be 10% from his pocket and 20% term loan is must. The minimum project cost under this scheme should have to be of 1 CR. Whereas for the planes, the minimum uh, project cost should have to be of like 3 CRs. Special weightage for this uh, unit establishment is like preference is given to uh, your this mega food parks if you're putting up your units in agro processing clusters or in mega food park. But from last year, they have uh, divided it into like two parts, 60% preference they are giving to the units which are coming up into the mega food parks or agro processing clusters and 40% they have given relaxation like if you want to put unit in your own uh, land then also you can apply. All food categories are covered under this except your uh, packaged drinking water or if you are interested for betel net processing that will not be covered. Apart from that if you are interested to put up animal feed units poultry feed, fish feed, they will also be covered under this scheme. The next one is uh, 
agro processing cluster this scheme is more popular with the name mini food park scheme because uh, in a region like northeast where somewhere it's plain somewhere it's hilly so getting 50 acre land which is the primary requirement for mega food park scheme we cannot fulfill so government started this mini food park scheme where you have to require only 10 acres of land in a single stretch and they are supporting with this uh, financial aid of maximum 10 CR or 50 percent for the development of that land under this scheme. Only one agro processing cluster is permittable in one district and if you have any mega food park or designated food park in that particular district then agro processing cluster will not be uh, provided in that region. Eligibility, as you can see, net worth 1.5 times. The minimum investment should have to be of 25 CR and 20% term loan, 10% uh, uh, 10 acres of uh, land requirement. The next one, like food safety and quality assurance scheme. Under this scheme, right now, food testing laboratory scheme is open where they are providing 100% support to state government or center government agencies and 75% 70% to the uh, sorry 50% to the private promoters if they want to come up with a food testing facility in a particular region another initiative for the farmers operation green where they are providing financial support for transporting the raw material more than 100 kilometers by road or by rail <coughs> earlier the scheme was well known with the name top tomato, onion and potatoes, only three commodities were there. But after COVID, they have included another 22 commodities. As you can see in this basket, all these commodities, they have covered uh, more than 25 commodities. I think uh, they have included uh, for providing this scheme, uh, for providing financial support for this scheme. For MSMEs, they have come up after COVID with this prime minister formalization for micro food processing enterprises. All previous scheme you have seen like they are their subsidy amount is in crores and minimum project cost are like like one crore or above like for the mega players those schemes were there but this one is for the grassroots level farmers or entrepreneurs where they are providing financial support of 35 percent maximum up to 10 lakh rupees suppose you are planning to put up a unit or already if you are having uh, existing some food processing premises so if you want to renovate or like upgrade that unit you can uh, avail this uh, uh, this uh, subsidy uh, scheme facility and you can get up to 10 lakh rupees for uh, the upgradation or for establishment of your uh, this thing uh, unit the scheme was initiated after covid in 20 and they, they have a target to uh, faci uh, facilitate or uh, uh, to provide support of like maximum 2 lakh units up to 24 25 in 5 years with a financial contribution of 10000 crores and if I'll see, like all ministries, they are contributing 10% in the Northeast. So 20,000 units they are going to support in Northeastern region through this scheme. This one is uh, not a subsidy scheme. Actually, this is a like, complete package where they are hand-holding right from the beginning to the end. They are providing support, 50% support up to maximum of least 10 lakh rupees for marketing, also branding and marketing of your product for printing, designing and those things, logos and company registration. So under this scheme, like not only grant is provided, they will support you for making your DPRs, connecting you with the market linkages, branding and marketing of your products. So it's a complete package. Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare, as earlier speakers, they have told they have started this uh, Mission Organic Value Chain Development Scheme, I think in uh, 2012 or 2014 this was started. And they have added a food processing component in this scheme in 2018 to handhold the organic growers. And for FPCs, they are providing a support of like 75% with maximum upper cap of 6 CR. I think phase 4 of this uh, scheme has started from 2023-24. Uh, for private entrepreneurs, they are providing support of like 50% of that upper cap of 6 CR. It's not compulsory that uh, you should go with the big projects, even small projects up to 25 lakh rupees are funded uh, or recommended by state governments itself. If the projects are higher than the 25 lakh rupees of uh, project cost, they will come to net fee and the review committee will review and sanction the grants. 
So already under the scheme in northeastern region, more than 35, uh, 40 projects has been sanctioned. Apart from this, uh, Ministry of Commerce and Industries, APIDA department, or you can say Agricultural and Food Processing Export Development Authorities, also having some export promotion schemes. Most of their schemes, they are providing support of 40 percent with an upper cap of 2 CR. Eligibility is almost same in these schemes also. So let us quickly see what are all the schemes APIDA is having. Integrated pack house just for the minimal processing, cleaning, sorting, grading and if you are APIDA registered uh, uh, company then you can export this, uh, these products to various countries they will handhold. Apart from that cold chain strengthening scheme where they are providing uh, refer vehicles with the maximum support as I have told up to 2 CR and 40 percent. Cable handling uh, systems, this one is mainly for the farmers like uh, those who are cultivating uh, bananas or jackfruits because these kind of commodities are difficult to handle at farm gate level. So they are supporting with that scheme. Coming to the processing facilities or upgradation, this one is somewhat similar to your creation and expansion of food processing preservation capacities but there is no restriction of putting up unit in mega food park or designated food parks under this scheme. And the next one is, this one is mainly for the government agencies where they are providing uh, support up to 6 CR and 90 percent subsidy, not only for the processing but to develop or to uh, put, uh, put up your this uh, testing facilities also. Other centre government uh, schemes include your Khadi and uh, Village Gram Udyog's uh, Vikas Yojana, where Village Industries Commission's uh, Khadi and uh, this your Gram Udyog Vikas Yojana. GVAY, where they are providing support with the amount of 1 lakh rupees to the FPCs, minimum group of uh, 10 people in a group in, in that FPC, they are providing support. They are hand holding with the training and providing machinery. Another one is like Department of DSTs uh, Nectar, which is in Shillong. They are supporting livelihood support program for food processing and other uh, uh, related areas also. So this is all about the initiatives, especially for the funding initiatives in the northeastern region. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep, uh, uh, for your uh, informations on the various schemes of the Ministry of Food Processing and Industries, and also the various schemes, components, details, and eligibility, and then cost of different schemes of uh, Minister of Agriculture. And then you also have mentioned something about the GDP in terms of uh, uh, agriculture and allied sector in the NER, this is the national uh, GDP. Uh, this really qualifies the 17 SDG goal. Normally for the agriculture sector, SDG 2 is the main uh, SDG, uh, which has been envisaged for the 17 SDGs for the country. Uh, yes, this really qualifies and this SDG 2 is also complementary to all the other 16 SDG uh, ambitious by the country. Uh, in terms of positioning of uh, countries, let me just share with all of you very interesting uh, figures of our country in terms of our position for the production of various agricultural and light uh, commodities or products. Uh, we all have to be proud of our country, India, because of being the first in the world in terms of production of milk, bananas, mangoes, papayas, guavas, ginger, okra, and buffalo meat. And it, uh, in terms of uh, second position, in terms of production of rice, wheat, potatoes, garlic, cashew, cashew nuts, dry beans, chickpeas, and inland fish. And then the, also, India ranks third in terms of production of eggs, coconut, tomatoes, and lentils. So we are living in a country where we have a lot of uh, advantages in terms of production, and then we can uh, lift our head hell high because of our farmers and the farming communities and the scientists, policy makers, and currently, the current dispensation government uh, led by the Honorable Prime Minister 
So the country is progressing uh, much ahead now. Uh, I would request a round of applause for this first, second, third position of the country in terms of production of many agricultural allied productions. So, uh, Dr. Sandeep, thank you so much for your uh, inputs. But only the small observation which I would like to flag here is many of the schemes introduced by uh, the Union, uh, Minister, uh, Ministry of uh, MOPI or the agriculture, especially the subsidies programs, somehow, to my understanding, from the northeastern region part of the country, many of these schemes apparently observed to be very challenging to many of the farmers and entrepreneurs because of this back and that subsidy. Uh, many, of the, this, uh, many of these programs are not 100% grant, and many of our farmers in the Northeast or the entrepreneurs in the Northeast, their collateral is a big issue because of the land ownership system. Um, I will not uh, go into details, just I would like to highlight that part only. Uh, these schemes are little uh, challenges to the farmers and the entrepreneurs in the Northeast. Well, apart from this, yes. Uh, lastly, your presentation also uh, given or you would like to give or maybe you wanted to suggest most on the cultivation practices, post-harvest technology, extensions program, marketing capacity building. So these are also some of the important uh, points we have captured. Uh, Nevertheless, the food processing or the agro processing sector in the Northeast apparently uh, is still a very big challenge uh, in the Northeast, maybe partly because of uh, production pattern where most of the productions, productions are happening in a very scattered way where the raw materials could not come in a bulk to a particular processing unit. That is why some of the programs of the MOPI, say for example, Mega Food Park, uh, somehow or the other has its challenges of getting the raw materials as the production pattern are scattered in nature. Uh, and also another important factor for the agro processing in the northeastern region is the virtual lack of credit from the formal banking institutions. This is also one of the factors. Number two, the transportation of the products from the remote corners of the production sites. Say for example, most of the fruits and vegetables are not uh, producing in the urban areas. These are producing in the little remote corners of the states. So coming to the processing unit, uh, it is a challenge. And then the, lastly, of course, uh, there is a lot more uh, factors are there. Set up of any uh, food processing units in the Northeast, in the remote areas, is a big challenge, partly because of the availability of the um, power. So in most of the Northeastern region, uh, the availability of power in the remote corners of the Northeast has hindered the establishment of food processing, even at the small and then the medium level processing units. So these are some of the points which I would like to share as a part of your um, presentation. Thank you one, uh, once again, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, with this, we conclude the presentation from all the panelists. Once again, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, sitting with me. Uh, now, uh, with the permission from all the panelists as well as from the audience, uh, I would like to open the presentation to the house for a short discussions, uh, meaning the audience, if you have any comments or uh, any interactions or anything more we'd like to know, uh, we would like to open the house. Thank you. Madam, please. Uh, just, uh, thank you so much for all the presentations. I'm sorry I uh, missed uh, Mr. Jamis, but I did hear the other three. And uh, they're very valuable and a lot of input came in. 
Just a few observations from, uh, and some of them, Mr. Mehta, you've already actually mentioned from whatever I've seen of the Northeast. One, connectivity is a major issue, both physical, digital, and power connectivity. I've seen um, food processing plants where the area has been designated as organic. It's been certified as uh, organic. The produce is there. The plant has been set up, but there is no power. So uh, the entire value chain dies because of that. And secondly is the capacity of the people there. So the capacity to understand where they can get credit from, the capacity to know how to enhance their skills, even the capacity to realize that some of the produce that they have would have a major, has a major market outside the Northeast, like jackfruit in Mizoram. Nobody consumes jackfruit in Mizoram. And Mizoram has everywhere you have jackfruit trees. So now uh, jackfruit flour, especially for diabetes, has been sold all over the world at a very high price and uh, jackfruit is just dying across northeast. It's just lying on the ground. There's no, there are no takers for it. So somewhere along the line, these two things, connectivity and capability. Uh, I think those are the things that we really need to focus on. And uh, the other things that you all have mentioned, our credit and all, are really important. That's what I'd like to add. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, uh, for your uh, supplementary information, uh, which the other panelists also uh, need to know. And in, the, in our next uh, uh, meetings or the, any of the other seminar conferences, let us uh, keep in mind that these are the few very inherent uh, problems which we are, meaning in the Northeastern region, we are facing as on that. And I hope and I believe most of our panelists who happens to be the part and parcel of uh, policy making and, and also the uh, developmental uh, um, uh, activist, I should, rather I should say, uh, must be knowing more than asked. So in our next uh, conferences or the other meetings, like let us uh, keep in our mind uh, to address all this issue. Thank you, Madam Wansi. Uh, well, I have a question. GI tags, geographical indication, India has put a lot of focus on that in terms of marketing the agro-producer, maybe handicrafts, coming to the food space, Northeast has a lot of producers, I mean food products, which has GI tag. But that certification is not the only thing that, you know, is required for marketing. What specific initiatives are being taken by the Northeastern region, maybe the authorities over there, in terms of marketing the GI products? Because most of these GI products are being actually been cut by the MSME, you know, entities over there. And they don't have that level of, you know, knowledge or maybe exposure to get those GI producers or maybe products to sell abroad. So any specific initiative from <coughs> the governments, state governments, to handhold those MSME entities to market their GI products, that's number one. Second thing is, Fruits being, I mean, fruit produce being a very prominent thing over there, and 40% of the, I mean, that's a statement which has been running across decades. That 40% of the fruit produce from Northeast goes wasted. Now, even on date, as on date, what's the status of cold chain infrastructure in Northeast in terms of initiatives taken by the government? Before I'm supplementing the observations or the questions from the uh, audience, may I request any one of our panelists would like to uh, provide some information? To market GI product, uh, Pan India and the global market, currently there is no organized business plan. If Big Basket, 24 Mantra or Niramak, they come forward with 10 year action plan because for GI products, there is huge market. See, from Nagaland, there is three tomato. Very uh, beneficial, health benefits are there and everything. Carbilong ginger, then your Johar rice, all they are having GI tax. But the production quantity is very little. So, no corporate can come and sell the product. First of all, we have to design an action plan to increase the productivity. Market is already there. 
Then number two for cold chain, I have a factory in Agartala. Also, we have set up one unit in Fusero, that is Nagaland Fake District, and another third in Lohit District. So cold chain facilities are not there. Operating cold chain facilities in Northeast is very high, running cost is very high. There should be a, some scheme to give concessions or the subsidies for running cost. Then only the major investor or the agripreneurs will come and start such facilities. Thank you. So the cold chains, uh, as I have told in my presentation also, ki like uh, they are giving subsidies, but again, as uh, JS Madam also pointed out and our uh, moderator also told ki we have several issues related to power availability 24 into 7 and like road and transport connectivity. Although even after that, Ministry of Food Processing has sanctioned more than six, I think six or seven uh, uh, cold, cold chain uh, projects throughout the northeastern region. Out of that, I think four are functional. Uh, one is in Gohati. I have personally visited. Uh, that one is functional, I think, since 2016-17. But, but again, huh, I accept this thing that said these uh, power availability and road transport connectivity from the hills and interiors is a bigger challenge. Thank you. Uh, well, I would like to supplement uh, some of the information to, in regards to GI. Yes, uh, GI program has been initiated by the NEC under the Minister of Dona, and this program has been given to one of our PSU called uh, Northeastern Regional Marketing, uh, Northeastern Regional Agricultural Marketing Corporation Limited, based in Guwahati. Uh, two phases has been done, and quite a uh, good number of crop has been the GI tagged. Yes, it is not the end of the tagging of that GI to the crops. However, some vibrant thing is happening in terms of black rice from Manipur. This, this is a GI tech. So uh, very recently, uh, with the introduction of uh, Uran scheme, uh, this black rice and then the king chilies from Manipur has been exported uh, to, uh, as, uh, to, to the country as far as the United States. But the actual destination, uh, I have to update myself. Then another crop, Q pineapple from Tripura that has also has been uh, you know, exported uh, to the Middle East. Many more must be happening, but this has to be updated from the, our PSU NARAM Act. Yes, in terms of coal chain uh, infrastructure, the presence of coal chain infrastructures in the Northeast is very less. And then in terms of post harvest lost in the Northeast, uh, nationally on an average, the post harvest loss is 33% as uh, identified by the Ministry of Food Processing Industries and many other institutions at the rate of 30, 33%. However, the post harvest loss in the Northeast is much more than this. It is as high as the 42 50% in the Northeast due to uh, various factors, as we have mentioned, the technology, the uh, inadequate uh, presence of storage, inadequate uh, uh, presence of uh, processing units. So nevertheless, yes, food chain has been come up. And in, in the recent past, the Ministry of Dona, under the instruction from the Honorable Minister, we had the Agriculture Task Force. The Agriculture Task Force has been uh, already assigned to look into the development and then the establishment of this cold chain. One of the recommendations has been uh, put on us. So this is under processed. So Naramek has been uh, interest, interested for identifying the locations for development and establishment of these cold chain food processing units in the Northeast. Thank you so much. Yes.
गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इज टू पी के वी वाई डेवलप इन ऑल कंट्री क्लस्टर मोड तो दे हैव टेकन एटलीस्ट टेन हेक्टेयर इन क्लस्टर मोड एंड ऑफ वर्क इज ऑलरेडी गोइंग गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया स्कीम लाइक पर्सनल ऑर्गेनिक फार्मिंग नॉट इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट इट इज ऑल ओवर कंट्री दिस प्रोग्राम सेम प्रोग्राम इज रन बाय द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट दैट एग्रीकल्चर इज द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट तो दे आर वर्किंग अपॉन थ्रू दैट दी डिफरेंट परंपरागत किसी अदर दैट Uh, i am talking about the pkvy program okay so this is not specially for the neh region the neh region is specifically for mocd ner that is uh, particularly for mission organic value chain uh, for the north eastern region so likewise the uh, parampara kishi vikas yojana that has been run by uh, i think uh, from uh, 2014 15 uh, particularly for promotion of the organic farming so this kind of scheme is already running for other states uh, well uh, thank you so much dr raghavendra L let me also just add some informations uh, though it is not uh, vibrantly happening as of now uh, the program of odop one district one product after clear grounding of this uh, program the happening of this uh, the block the village the district level of uh, organic farming will be uh can be envisaged number 2 the formation of uh, apos is happening in a very vibrant way in the northeast so therefore most of the uh, apos what we have come across some of them have already started the production of organic products as a part of odop as a part of the apos in some of the states but though in a very uh, uh, lesser and very insignificant way as of now Uh, for example uh, in the state of assam a place called uh, a district called nagao some pockets some villages has been already taken up a mass scale of uh, some of the vegetable crop as organic farming so it is uh, coming up but though it is very difficult to explain currently as i said odop apos will certainly bring on board the happening of that district level block level village level organic farming in the northeast I'll just add one word to that. One is the policy level. The policy level is there. The other is a reality. Okay. Now, in reality, production in the northeast, especially in the hills, I don't even want to call it organic by default, because it's not by default. It is by practice. And I don't want to call it organic because nowadays to be called organic, you need certification. but it is chemical free by practice and the challenge is despite the fact that it is chemical free despite the fact that it is organic there is no systemic certification processes and therefore it's very very difficult for any government or community to claim at especially at an international market that it is organic number 2 despite the fact that communities are doing it organically they are competing government schemes which require external inputs whether it's floriculture or whether agriculture and if you are investing in an organic production and suddenly your neighbor has a floriculture unit then you are gone <laughs> because the the pollinators and so many other environmental factors come into play so i think there needs to be a more systemic uh, uh, attention paid with regards to competing ministries and competing agencies promoting different crops which require external inputs and those that don't require external inputs and how do we therefore go about that so definitely there it's very complex so it's a very strong idea let's say we can take gobi along with all organic it gives a lot of uh, marketing leverage to that area and you know a lot of surplus can be generated that way uh 
well, uh, time has come to an end for this for uh, for the session. Uh, I would like to take uh, last one more questions from the audience. Oh. Yeah, I am the private secretary to Honorable Cabinet Minister for Development of Northeastern Region. It has been a privilege and pleasure to listen to all the experts. I'm very happy to have been a part of this session. And thanks to Mr. Methi for coordinating everything. So uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to tell everybody here that uh, this session has give a, given us an inspiration that probably a day-long seminar is needed on food processing and the scope in Northeast. Obviously, some of you would know and some probably do not know that the Honorable Minister has taken initiative to uh, organize the first ever investment summit for entire Northeastern region. And food processing is one of the focus sectors. So as of now, uh, we have done some road shows, state level round tables, and a lot of private sector engagement has happened uh, with the state governments. And obviously food processing sector was, as I said, a focus area. Uh, so with this background, probably, it is very relevant to have a longer discussion to get experts like you to participate and as one of the speakers has mentioned, an action plan, a concrete action plan, identifying specific roles for all the you know, actors we have. It's not that government doesn't have agencies, uh, ministry itself has NERAMAC, which, which is the lead agency in this area. And as somebody mentioned, each ministry is promoting its own focus area and a coherence is needed, a dovetailing of policies is needed. Central government subsidizes probably on the capital side and what is happening on the revenue side, nobody's looking into it. Maybe the state governments can pitch in and change their uh, you, you know, subsidies and certain carve-outs are needed. We understand FPI schemes, thanks for that presentation, it was very helpful. But the uptake is not at all encouraging. So one needs to see what tweaks are needed in the policy, perhaps some carve-outs for northeastern region. So all these, I mean, potential areas for discussion and obviously scientific inputs from organizations like ICAR. So this seems like uh, definitely deserving a longer discussion. So this is my takeaway from this. Uh, I'll definitely uh, present it to the Honorable Minister that we need a longer discussion into bringing all the stakeholders together. And probably NEC also should see how we can, you know, when we pose the projects either to the central sector or state sector, you know, let them select. I mean, if there is a power issue or if the road connectivity in certain areas is an issue, I mean, those projects should be posed for selection. We have funds. I mean, funds is not at all a problem now. We are running in surplus. It's just matching the demand with the funds. So hopefully we'll have uh, b better direction, better coherence. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, sir, Baskar, sir, for your uh, observations and comments. Uh, nevertheless, uh, some of the information which you, you have shared to us, like certainly I'll take it up to the NEC level so that this can be reached out to many of the stakeholders. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, the session, the session come to an end before uh, we are giving the uh, board of thanks from the Mr. Lemmy, the general manager, Netfi, I just would like to share some of the information very, very inherent uh, to the Northeast. Before this, like, I would like to welcome uh, Sir Counselor, uh, the Senior Economic Advisor. Sir, do, do, sir, do you have anything to uh, say? Okay. Uh, sir, we welcome you, sir, though you have reached a little late, uh, even then uh, we are very happy that uh, you are with us. Uh, Councilor happens to be one of our senior officers in the NEC. He, he stayed, he worked, and then he served NEC uh, as a director planning, then looked after many, 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 uh, many sectors in the uh, NEC, and finally he looked after NEC as an economic advisor, human resource development. Now, currently, sir is working as a senior economic advisor to the Ministry uh, Ministry of Development of Northeastern Region. Sir, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'll not take much time, but uh, 
this, if I don't uh, share this information, I thought uh, our today's event is a little inconclusive in understanding uh, many of the inherent aspects where the Northeast is facing currently. Uh, we talked about the food processing, the cultivations uh, of the various food crops and everything. Uh, the inherent problem what we have here in the Northeast is the dependency in the of this NER is highly dependent on imports for almost all the commodities for which we have the data. Notice we produce the fruits, the vegetables, I will not name specifically all those one by one, and many commodities, except some essential commodities. We have all the data of this production, but we all depend on the imports outside the region. This is a very inherent uh, issue which we have and then uh, from time to time in all the meetings, in all the seminars, symposium, all the forums, we keep saying that we have the potentials. But I still do believe and think that still most of the potential are untapped and locked. Although there is a few commodities which we have the advantage, so for example, the spices. In terms of uh, cardamom, black pepper, chili, turmeric, and cinnamon, which is considered to be high value, low volume, long shelf life. This is our advantage. But still, then, like we are having challenges under this uh, uh, sector also. And then another point is each state has distinct, distinctive production advantage vis a vis the other any states and the rest of the country. Yet, Every state produces almost all the products it needs for the internal consumption only. This suggests lack of sufficient uh, trade board amongst the any state as production pattern across the any states. Say, for example, rice is preferred by everybody, so rice is growing in all the states. So this is another uh, issue what we have here in the Northeast. And then what are the constraints in the agricultural growth? Let me just share with you. The geographical terrain in the Northeast has been, the, it is an organic terrain only, divided into the plain valleys and then the hills. So in the plain area, small holding is a big problem. Uh, lack of irrigation facilities is a big problem. Absence of water retention practices severely limits the possibilities of multiple cropping and then the absence of high yielding varieties. These are the, some of the inherent problems in the plain areas. Similarly, in the hills, agricultural productivity is constrained not only by the paucity of water, but also by the fact that land is held not by the individuals, but by the community as a whole. So the land tenorship in the Northeast is also a very, very important factor, limiting the possibility of production of many of the crops under the agriculture and allied sector. Therefore, the lack of individual ownership rights may be the important reason why the region is considered to be one of the hotspots, though for the biodiversity. On the other side, the zoom or the shifting cultivations. So this is another constraint to the agricultural growth in the Northeast. We have been talking about the potential of the horticulture in the Northeast. Yes, we do have but this also constrains by many factors. Uh, uh, basically, under the horticulture sector, yes, we have been uh, discussed, and then this has been highlighted by many of our pan panelists, the transportation, the, the post-harvest uh, post uh, facilities, cold chains, cold storages, So these are uh, the limiting factor for the horticulture. And then agro-processing for the topic, this will be the last point which I would like to share with all of you. Virtually no effective processing industry in the Northeast, though subject to correction, many things is happening currently. And uh, many of the processing units are suffering from both supply and demand problems and grossly underutilized and incurlogist. And geographical isolation, which we have discussed, the scattered 
production pattern, and the cost on materials and final product, inadequate working capital, poor marketing strategies, lack of marketing, uh, market intelligence, absence of sales promotions, inability to compete with established brand names due to comparatively low and uncertain qualities. So we have the potential, but like we have a lots of limiting factors. With these few words, uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank all my panelists on the dais and also all the audience who had uh, sparing your valuable time with us and sharing the thoughts. Uh, I will conclude my speech here and I would request let me, uh, Mr. Lemmy, to give a word of thanks to the panelists as well as the audience. Thank you so much. Jai Hind. Uh, I'll request uh, Sri Devajit Khan, the senior economic advisor, uh, to share his thoughts. Respected uh, chairman of today's meeting, respected panelists, uh, because of some urgent works in the office, uh, I was a bit late. I, I, I missed a uh, lot of the discussions, but. In the last part, I got the essence um, about this today's session. Uh, this is uh, on, on the matters of organic farming and uh, horticulture crops. Uh, uh, I have uh, one or two thoughts which uh, I'd like to share. The one thing is that uh, uh, why organic and horticulture produce, producers are not getting remunerative prices in the Northeast, that is one concern that comes to my mind always. Uh, another thing is that our biggest market uh, is nearer our home, that is Bangladesh or other South Asian countries. Because horticulture produce have a low shelf life to bring it to the mainland of India or to export is a long way. The, our biggest market probably may be the neighbors. The neighbors are culturally similar to us Culturally, they, their food habits and everything are similar to us, but exports are not much happening because of some reasons. Because uh, I'm all the things that you have, you need market linkage, you need this thing. But the the crux is that this the the main biggest market will come from the neighboring countries only, because Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Bangladesh, our neighbors, and we have land. Uh, custom stations are there, but there are some policies, policy issues are there which we are looking at. at after coming to the Ministry of Governor, uh, in fact, last few days, I am just looking at the uh, main issues which is hampering our progress in these sectors, not only agriculture. Agriculture is main because in the, the, the ICP or land custom stations, we have links with Bangladesh through Tripura. We have links with Myanmar through More border, or we have links with Bangladesh through, uh, through uh, uh, Meghalaya. But the positive list and negative list are there in the exports, which is hampering us. The most of the things of agriculture produce, they need certification. Because if you want to export it, you need certification, as well as quarantine facilities in the, in the, in the border areas. 
This is one of the factors. We cannot export our agricultural produce to Bangladesh. It is not allowed from Tripura. Some of the items we can, we can export from uh, Petrapol, which is uh, again in uh, West Bengal. So we have a go long way. So a lot of things, um, agriculture commodities exports need uh, phytosanitary, that uh, Mete will know that a lot of, lot of certification are necessary. Certification needs time. Uh, we do not have certification facilities at the border areas. This is hampering our exports to the neighboring areas. Number two, uh, if, we, if we agree to agree to take cognizance of the certificates issued by the neighboring countries, if Bangladesh agrees to our certification, then probably we'll be able to uh, send our agriculture produce to Bangladesh. This is easier. So there are a lot of positive and negative list. This is one factor which is, to my mind, is, uh, is, is a factor that probably our ministry and uh, at the central level will look, will try to look it. Uh, still, uh, I have arrived in the ministry two months back, but these are the issues. Slowly, we are getting to learn that some of the issues are there. We are talking with the industry associations. We are talking with the exporters which is hampering our progress. And regarding production, of course, organic, entire, entire country or entire state cannot go organic. Because organic, uh, if you go, everybody is organic, then uh, probably uh, our food security will be hampered. Because Sikkim may be, entire state of Sikkim may be organic. Or entire district of Assam may be organic for few products. This can be, this we have to segregate. Suppose one Nogao district is for one product. Uh, Lakhimpur is for one product. You, you, you cannot have variety of products for organic production uh, in, in area. Organic per se, it should be for either for export or for export also we need a lot of certifications. That certification is, is, is a time consuming affair. Because to get organic certificate, you will need at least five years. One plot has to be monitored tightly uh, by the agency. Then you get certification. It needs five years. Five years constant uh, vigilance is necessary. Uh, recently, we have uh, granted one scheme to Nectar. Uh, Nectar is also one of the agency, uh, Government of India. They are doing some plots. Uh, they will be doing for re getting ready for organic uh, farming. Because international certificate for organic farming is very, very difficult to get, very difficult. For in internal consumption, okay, it, uh, internal consumption, it is, it is easier. For international variety, certification is very difficult. But if we want to get remunerative prices for our produce, probably uh, in future we have to uh, identify areas along with their specific produce. that. This area will go for organic. This, this is the future because our branding is organic. Northeastern region, as uh, Honorable Prime Minister has also always emphasized, and organic value chain mission is also going on. So, if you can have a brand name, brand name that this is produced in Northeast, this is organic. That brand name creation will take time, but constantly we will we'll have to hammer the idea. Constantly we have to push it through through different channels. Otherwise, uh, um, Northeast with a small population, with a geographical isolation, we cannot do regular marketing. This has to be a niche marketing. This has to be organic. The, the moment people remember this is in Nagaland, they will, they will have to somehow connect it to that this, is, this has to be organic. This is from Manipur, this has to be organic. This is from Assam, this has to be organic. So this kind of brand naming, is, uh, brand name creation is very important. And I also think uh, our organizations, Ministry of Donor and NEC will work together. And we, we have ICR in, in Silong. We have all, all organizations uh, are taking, uh, are, are in notice now. Nectar, I have just mentioned, Nectar is for technology, not for research purpose. Nectar, Nectar is an organization many people do not know. In fact, I was also not aware of Nectar for a long time. Now Nectar has a head, Headquarter office now they have opened in Silang. So Nectar is also one of the organization which is helping us in this matter because Nectar is northeastern region for technology, not research purpose. Technology for outreach. This is an organization who is not doing uh, research. Research has already been done. Research has already already been done. This has been established that 
we can we can be a powerhouse in agriculture produce. This is the way forward because otherwise, as as we have mentioned, we have already uh, mentioned spices, large cardamom. Large cardamom is uh, is in Sikkim or in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. We, we we can be major exporter of large cardamom. Large cardamom is a heavy prices. So uh, likewise, we can identify two or three crops which can be. Uh, linked with organic production and have international marketing. And regarding the other fruits producers and vegetable producers, we are exporting. Of course, if we can export to our Bangladesh or our Myanmar, then it will be more profitable. Rather than we are we are sending some cartons maybe to London also, maybe maybe to USA also, and our Middle East also major customer. But that is not in a big way because air transport is very costly. And if you can export to land custom stations, that will be very, very uh, helpful for northeastern region. So, so in this regard, we can probably think of uh, what are the measures needed. As I mentioned once, uh, that lab, uh, uh, the laboratories at the uh, at the ICPs or land custom stations, uh, immediate certification, and also some kind of agreement with the the uh, neighboring countries, so that. The agriculture produce are not in the negative list. Uh, mostly, it should be in the positive list. So, these are the things uh, that just came to my mind. So, I wa wanted to share. And from this seminar, the the minutes and as well as the action plans will be coming up. As uh, our chairman has already mentioned, that one agriculture task force has already been constituted and uh, their recommendations are already there. The, the next step will be to, to form a, a cabinet note or um, from uh, then so to operationalize these this, uh, recommendations of the task force. Agriculture task force, uh, slowly, because agriculture ministry we have found recently, we have uh, analyzed and then we have actually 10% GBS, there is one concept everybody is aware of probably. The 55 line ministries of government of India, they have to spend 10% of their funds in uh, northeastern India. One of the ministries is Ministry of Agriculture. And unfortunately, Ministry of Agriculture cannot and over the years have not been able to spend 10% of their funds in northeastern region. The reasons being uh, the most of the schemes are beneficiary oriented. We do not have that many beneficiaries. We have um, which maybe two percent of population, many people uh, do not have land holdings. So the Ministry of Agriculture over the years have not been able to spend uh, ten percent of their uh, their budgetary provision so in this year also. Uh, so uh, now uh, I'd like to wind up here. Secretary uh, Donna is coming. Oh, Secretary Donna was supposed to come, but uh, since. He may come, but uh, in his absence, uh, I conclude the, conclude my part here, and I'll hand over the mic to Lemley. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak a few lines, and we'll work together as Ministry of Donor and NEC and all our organizations. Thank you very much. So we have really run out of time. Uh, actually, the Secretary Donor uh, wanted to join, so we were just, uh, to accommodate him, we were stretching, but. From 2 o'clock, this hall will be occupied for a DPIT's program. So we have really run out of time. Uh, we have a small formality left. Uh, we have some, uh, as a token of appreciation for all the speakers uh, and the moderator who uh, conducted today's session. We have uh, some mementos for them. Uh, kindly, uh, we'll quickly. These are actually products from Northeast, uh, uh, assortment of products from Northeast. Uh, many of these food products are supported by NETFI uh, through its various programs. Yeah, quickly we can uh, just last to be there. So we are uh, very much thankful to all the audience who came and gave a patient hearing. And uh, it was a very enlightening uh, session. And... Uh, And uh, I would also request uh, Bhaskar sir to accept uh, this memento from Netvi. Uh, and uh, Khan sir, uh, please uh, accept uh, a memento from 
Netfi. Kaunsar is also a director in the Netfi's board. Yes. Thank you, sir. So on behalf of the ministry and uh, Netfi, uh, I thank all the uh, audience and uh, today's speakers and moderator. Thank you so much.